printing to pay interest, which is what the government's doing right now, causes more inflation. So it's inflationary. The Fed's trying to combat inflation. The government's doing everything the opposite way. So what do you see when you look at that? What is the, the glaring, obvious thing that you see right now looking at that chart? That we are at a high point in the market. We, we are at a 52 week high, but we're almost at all time highs. In a time when it's blatantly obvious, the economy is weakening, the Fed is curbing inflation by raising interest rates, everything's more expensive. You can see the sign. That right there should be the only freaking thing any of you that have money in the stock market should see. You might not get another chance to get out and make the money that you are right now. Welcome back, everybody. It's another week, another wealth webinar. And today, Mr. Snaggy and myself have a very interesting show for you because what we're going to do is we're going to hit it head on. In the news today, if you haven't seen it, the United States of America got downgraded. We went from A++ down to AAA rated. That's a downgrade. That was from Fitch. And a lot of people won't understand the reasons for that, but what I want to do is just very quickly in the beginning of this wealth webinar, point out just a couple of the reasons why I believe Fitch downgraded the United States. Some of it has to do with the massive money printing, because if you really look at the United States of America, it's, it's the leading nation. It's the empire that's at the top. And our dollar is the reserve currency. It's what oil is, is valued in. It's used by 60% of, or in 60% of all transactions worldwide. The, the dollar is the all reigning king. And when you really look at what's happened in the last couple of years, okay, and it's actually been since 2008, if you really want to start measuring it, it's probably before then, but I'm really just going to kind of bring you through just, just from the pandemic on, because it's just easier to wrap your head around it because you can remember it. So during the pandemic, they printed, you know, at that time, an unprecedented 5.1 trillion. So that made it about 11 trillion in printing since, uh, I don't know if they measured that from the, the Great Recession straight through. But the 5.1 trillion is a lot of the reason why we, we had massive inflation. Some would call it hyperinflation over 9%. One of the main reasons why the price of everything seems to have gone up, but it's really not. That's an illusion. Yes, the price is more, but it's not that the price is more. It just takes more dollars to buy the same goods and services. That's what inflation is. It's a hidden tax. And inflation is tr traditionally caused by monetary policy and by the Fed. And the tre well, the Treasury really prints it, but the Fed controls the monetary policy. They printed a lot of money. And every time they print a dollar, and, and I've done this before, but I'll just give you the visual of this because it makes it a lot easier. So we all have money, okay? And when they print a dollar, it takes a little value from your current dollars. Every time they print more money, it's literally stripping value from your current dollars. And folks, don't call any of the legal authorities. These are not real dollar bills because I know you can go to jail for defacing money. But, but this is essentially what has been happening since 1913. Essentially, when they print money, and the printing presses have been running nonstop, but very heavily recently, value gets devalued. Uh, if you want the best example or the most drastic example, you can go back to the World War II or World War II. You can look at uh, Germany, and you can look at what happened there. They had massive inflation. Okay, they had piled up massive amounts of debt because they printed and printed and printed. So those two elements basically made the the German mark worth almost worthless. You've all probably seen the picture from history class of the man with the wheelbarrow filled with German marks buying a loaf of bread. So that's the impact of inflation. To, to combat that, you have the Fed. Okay, The Fed is not owned by the United States government. It is a complete independent operation. The Fed, is it, its number one job is to protect the dollar under, at, at any cost. That includes war. That includes any cost. Their job is to protect the dollar. So if you understand that, you'll understand a little bit about what's been going on. 11 rate increases in just over a year. We've gone from close to zero interest rates up to over 5%. You all have felt it. You all see it. I'm not making this up. And, and I'm trying to keep this as fifth grade level as you can. And all I want you to know is like, if you go, out, go to try to buy a used car today, the used car rates are about 8%. I think they're about the same for new cars. If you uh, try to get a mortgage, uh, we're going to go into this. 
north of seven plus percent. You guys remember when we were at 3%. I mean, that wasn't real. The, the Fed kept us at too low of interest rates for too long. They made money too easy and too cheap for too long. And what that did is it stimulated a lot of people to buy a lot of things and spend a lot of money, especially during the pandemic, because when they opened it back up, we went out and we spent money, kind of how that video said. And we went out and spent money. It drove massive demand for goods and services, but the demand in the, su the supply chains were, were hurt, okay? During the pandemic, people weren't working. They didn't want to go back to work. There was so many issues that it, that it hurt the supply. So you had a demand problem. Really, you had a supply problem. You couldn't supply enough for, to fill the demand. And that's caught up now, okay? But, but the Fed, first, they called it transitory. Well, we don't really have an inflation problem. No problem, nothing to see here, kind of as someone earlier said. And then all of a sudden they realized, oh, we have a problem, but now we're going to slay the dragon and hence brings us to the current time of really high interest rates, which you can look at that as good or bad. I guess it's bad if you're going out and looking for loans. It's bad if you're trying to get a new home mortgage because number one, it's expensive to get a home mortgage or expensive to borrow money, but it's also very difficult to borrow money right now. And that comes down to the, the central banks making it very hard. They constrict the money circulation, the money flow. And they were doing that by basically you know, unwinding their balance sheet, by maturing their bonds. It, it gets complicated, but we'll just keep it at that. So they make money hard to get. They make money expensive to use, which slows the economy down. However, there's one missing piece. Because I don't know. I mean, all of you, you know, that are on here, we got 105 people little light for today, but how many of you feel like we're in a recession right now? Put I in the chat. How many of you feel <laughs> we need to return to sound money? You're damn right we do. So some people are saying it feels like we're in a recession. Well, by, by actual technical like qualifications, the old ones, not the new ones that they changed the rules, we, we technically are. And also, if you've been paying attention to inflation, the Fed has been dropping inflation. By making money expensive, constricting money flow, and basically controlling monetary policy, they've brought inflation from nine down to three. <laughs> Stephen and I laugh about this all the time. If you're looking, and if you, if you research it right now and you look at what is the current inflation rate? 3%. How many of you actually believe inflation's 3%? Because the real inflation, if you factor in housing, if you factor in oil and fuel, and if you factor in all the things that they've changed, see, this is one thing, like data is only as good as the source. They keep changing the source because they know how bad it is, but they don't want you to know that. So they change the source. The real inflation number, and, and this is a hard one to pinpoint, so I'm just going to give you a range, is about 10 to 20%. And now that feels more real, doesn't it? Because it seems like groceries have doubled in cost. Yeah, just an inflation chart over the last several years here. You know, it's um, one thing when we, you know, when we say, oh, everything's good, you know, we're back down to 3% inflation, we have it under control, but that's, it's year over year inflation. So if we add 3% where we are today to the 9% or so where we were this time last year, I mean, that's 12% just really over the last, you know, couple of years, you couple that in the prior year, we were up pushing six. I mean, now we look at the last two to three years, we're pushing, you know, according to them, 20% increase just over the last two to three years. And like you said, when you factor in actual inflation, look at real world numbers that people actually feel, that number is actually much higher. And so that all leads to less spending power of the U.S. dollar. What we buy today gets us a lot less now at that same dollar. And 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 when we look at real world wages and, and wage increases, they are not anywhere near those kinds of raise, uh, rises to keep up with that inflation. So in the real world, people really are feeling that the cost of how much everything's gone up. You know, you're probably all thinking like, why are we going into this? This is some of you think this is useless information, but it's not. So let me bring you to a white paper that I just got. We, we subscribe to many economic newsletters. For most people, it, it puts you to sleep. So if you ever want to go to sleep, subscribe to economic white papers and newsletters. But I love the stuff. And one just came out today. And it talks about, there's a report that's put out by the Fed. I, I believe it's the New York Fed. And it, and it talks about the spending or the debt the U.S. government is borrowing. So we would all think right now, you know, the deficit, just so you all know, and again, this is some know, some don't, some don't care, but the deficit right now is running about 120% of GDP. Now, 
to, to spell out GDP, it's gross domestic product. So to put that into perspective, let's just say a family makes $100,000 gross. Okay, gross. You all understand that. Not net, gross. They make $100,000, but they go out and they spend $120,000. What happens? Nothing good, right? That's what the government's doing, and they've been doing this. Now, this has been done before in the past. So you got to look at the at the past to really understand you know, where we're headed in the future. This has been done before. It was done in, in World War II. We were running really big deficits back in World War II, but that was because we were fighting a war, funding a war. Wars are very expensive. And you know, the, the thing that's different about a war than right now is a war has an end. Never soon enough, okay, but it has an end. And if a government is printing money and spending money and racking up debt to fund a war, they know eventually the war is going to end, okay? And it did, and after that, we had economic prosperity, and, and we all know that to be after World War II. Families came home, productivity growth. So this is the thing you got to understand. So here, real quick on the board, I just want to try to get you all to just understand some things. This is, I know. Some don't think this is important, but this is incredibly important. This is what productivity growth looks like. So productivity is what we typically think of as, as normal growth. When you go to work, if you work longer, there's more productivity. If, if you have a family that goes to work on the farm, there's more productivity than just the one, you know, the father or the mother working, right? So productivity is increased when there's more people working in the workforce. So right now you have a lot of a lot of people in the workforce working, and that's shown by low unemployment. But back after World War II, you had women you know, going into the workforce. You had men coming back from the war, re-entering the workforce. So you had strong productivity growth. But on top of productivity growth, there's also other cycles. Some of you know this uh, because of Ray Dalio, and this is kind of how I got this chart. This isn't mine. This is, this is kind of just the cycles. These are, th this is debt induced growth. Okay. This would be short term debt cycles. All of you have seen these. So we'll just call these little gaps here. These are short term, usually every seven to 10 years. Okay. So this is what we typically know as a recessionary period. So depending on how old you are, just go from the dot com recession to the great recession. It's a short term, okay, cycle. It's a short term, seven to 10 year. It's the rise and fall, all due to debt. Okay. Easy money supply versus constricted money supply. Sounds familiar to what's happening now. But then you've got this big boy here, which is the long-term debt cycle. But this big one right here is a 75-year cycle in which we are at the end, okay? So we are at the end of a short-term debt cycle. We are at the end of a long-term debt cycle. And productivity is just going to go, but it's going to go where it is. So how do you increase productivity? Have more children. Immigration. So you're looking at, you know, the, you know, how many you know, people from uh, Mexico are coming in. Immigration, our, our immigration policy seems to be pretty loose. So lots of immigrants coming in. But that's that's actually some people see that as really bad. If you're in Texas, that that's probably not good. You don't like that. But from a government standpoint, they do because it increases productivity because it's more people in the workforce. So they make it really easy to come into the United States and have opportunity. And just look at any of the country or any of the companies throughout the past. How many of them were founded and started by immigrants? You've heard this. You know folks. Like my parents you know, came here on a boat. We've heard this a million times that their parents are incredibly successful in some cases because they came here to work and to see a better life for their family. Productivity. Okay, That's productivity. So the only way to increase productivity is to have a place, a, 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 an opportunity for people to want to come to the United States of America. Now, who doesn't want to live in the United States of America? If you live in Africa, you want to live in the United States? Yes. If you live in China, do you want to live in the United States? I don't know. If you live in Russia, Ukraine, if you live in any, almost anywhere else in the country, maybe not Europe, but you know, all the emerging countries, they want to live in the US. It's, it's, it's the greatest opportunity of their life. And, and folks, I just, I say this because you do live in the United States of America, the greatest country on earth, the land of the free and the land of the greatest opportunity on earth. Don't ever let that slip from your mind. How many of you on here came from another country because of the opportunity? Did anyone? I know it's, oh, so somebody's asking about hats. We'll get to the hats in a second. So I'm just trying to get you to understand. So this is, this marks X where we're at. The government, okay, has to increase productivity because they cannot keep printing money. Just so you know, current quarter, how much, does anyone know how much money the government is slated to borrow this quarter? Does anyone know? 
I, I, there's not enough zeros on the screen, but I'll, I'll just say 007, okay, is the end, but it's got a one in front of it and it's got a T after it. Does anyone know what that is? There's not enough, there's not enough space on this screen to write all the zeros. Over a little over a trillion dollars, a trillion 007, okay? That's how much this quarter they're gonna do. How about fourth quarter? It's slated that they're gonna do, I think it's 153 billion. Now, can I just put this into perspective? This is one quarter how much the US government's going to borrow. And they're not borrowing it to fund a war. They're borrowing it because they spend too much money on social programs and because politicians, I don't care red or, or blue, are all focused on getting more votes. That's it. They're focused on buying votes. They're not focused on longevity. They're not focused on the long-term you know, United States like our forefathers were or our founding fathers. So when you really think about this, 853 billion just in the fourth quarter, okay? Do you know that in 2008, it was an unprecedented bailout, the biggest in history, it was $900 billion to stop what would have been a complete collapse of the United States financial system. Make no two ways about it. 2008 was that serious. And they printed $900 billion. Yes, it was 2008, not indexed for inflation, but $900 billion was printed to save this country from financial collapse during the Great Recession. And this next quarter, the fourth quarter, Okay, not next, but the, the fourth quarter. This is third quarter, just so you know. The next quarter, they're gonna they're gonna print or they're gonna borrow 853 billion. I'm just trying to get you to think about what's really happening out there. Just just to put that a little more in perspective, really opened up the floodgates. I mean, in 2020, um, they printed 3.38 trillion, and in 2021, they printed 13 trillion dollars. So just un unfathomable numbers. It's it's insane. There you go. 1.3. Thanks, Brian. So here's the thing. Why am I saying all this? What, what, you're, you're, some of you are thinking, well, the numbers are going up, which is good. But some of you are thinking, what the hell does this have to do with me? That's what I'm going to get to. Because they're borrowing so much money, we all know something, right? Interest rates have been going up. We already talked about that. I'm going to bring it back to interest rates. Interest rates have gone up to curb inflation. So let me just draw a line. This is this is why they do it. They're trying to bring inflation down, which they have. We've gone from nine, a little over nine plus percent. And so they say we're at three. Now, X marks the target. The target is two. Okay, that's their target rate. So this is what we got to keep eyes on. Whether it's real inflation or their made up number, that's where they want to be, two. So we're a percent away, which basically can tell you that these interest rate increases are probably going to come to an end in maybe one or two more rate hikes. They might freeze next time. Who knows? It's anyone's bet. But we're getting close. So when they raised interest rates from close to 0% during the pandemic to over 5%, it cost you more money to borrow money. But who else did it cost more? The United States government. It cost the United States government more money to borrow. So the United States government borrows money, and, it, and it's done in a unique way. I don't want to bore you, but... The, the Fed, you know, and the Treasury, they print money. They don't just give it to the government, okay? It's injected. The government borrows the money from the central banks, okay? So they borrow money and they exchange it for debts, IOUs, treasuries, which I always talk about, right? Because here, remember, inflation, although they want inflation to go down, but what else does it do? It, on bonds, on treasury bonds, it brings price down. Interest rates go up, price of bonds goes down, okay? Inflation, price. So just that inverse relationship. Some of you have heard me teach about treasuries and the great opportunity there is now, and it's still a great opportunity. Some of you are like, I bought treasuries and they're going down. Of course they're going down. They're raising interest rates. What I told you that was going to happen. You just lost some more money uh, today, actually. I think you're down, depending on which treasury you bought, you're down a buck or two bucks per share. Buy more. I don't know what else to tell you. You got you to gotta feel the pain a little bit before you get the glory. Does anyone really think you can get glory without pain? Anyone watch Rocky Balboa? He went through a lot of pain to see glory, right? Every success story, there's pain, there's suffering, and then there's the glory. That's what we hear, but we only focus on the glory. So I'm just saying like, this is painful. Where we're at is painful, but we're almost at the end. Interest rates then will then take a turn because we will be in a recession. I don't care what you read. I don't care who tells you we're not going into a rece recession. It's normally going to be your advisor. We will. We already are, but we will be in a recession. No ifs, ands, or buts. The only thing that's stopping this is employment. That's it. People are employed. It's the only reason. Unemployment numbers are low. So again, so to recap, 
Rates have been going up. It's costing the government a ton more money because their bonds, the IOUs that I'm telling you to buy, the treasury bonds are costing the government more money, double in interest. Because treasuries just a few short years ago were like one, 2%. Now they're over 5%. That's what I'm talking about. So who's paying that one to two to 5%? Who's paying that extra money? The government is. And, and the government is slated in the next year to pay a trillion dollars in interest on their debt, on the debt that they have now. I mean, if they keep printing more and more money, it's creating issues. But how is there a silver lining in all this? Well, let's just hit the first thing. So we know that interest rates are going to go back down the other side because we're going to be in it. We're going to be in a recession. Okay, this this will will become unemployment, and then we'll we'll basically go down the other side. And when we go down the other side, what will happen? We'll start entering another period. Okay, where they drop interest rates. Okay, which stimulates buying. They make money easy. They print some more money, which I'm sure they will do. But then it also starts creating inflation again. So inflation, we might enter stagflation. God forbid. But I think. I think it'll be in a, I think it'll be a slow inflationary growth or a stagflation. But what that will do to your bonds is increase the price. Mathematically, it happens every time. So you can buy low and sell high with treasuries. But what else does this create an opportunity for? Let me just fast forward. This is why I opened with that video 2025. A look from the future back, a broadcast from the future looking backwards. It'll be on YouTube soon. So I want to tie this into a couple things. Okay, I want to tie this into the pain. So the first thing we're going to hit right now is we're going to hit the pain. Stephen, can you pull the chart up on real estate? Because we talk a lot about real estate. Real estate's created more millionaires than anything else. It's created more millionaires because real estate's always been a great investment. But there, it also can be a terrible investment if you do it wrong. So right now, one of the pains that we face is because of all the inflation, it has created a median home price that is very high, almost double where it was in the not far along ago past. So right now, yeah, where were we? Uh, just look, look, 2020, where were we at for median home price, Stephen? Let's see. So 2020, we were around 320,000. So 320,000 was the median home price throughout the United States. So in, that includes California and New York City. Uh, now just go forward to where we're at today. I want you to look at this fallout right here because there's a lot of people that keep saying real estate's not going to come down in price. Real estate's going to maintain its price. Real estate's going to hold. Well, it's already fallen, folks. And uh, it's falling because quarters. of what I'm telling you. Yeah, we topped out in 2000, at the end of 2022 at 479 and it's fallen the last two quarters, 429 and 416. So let's just hit that. You see the trend. It's right there in front of you. All of you have access to this. This is just Google. Okay. So prices of real estate are coming down. So if prices of real estate are coming down, what does that present in the future a potential opportunity? But it just shows you a trend line of where we're going. And that's because interest rates are so high. So the median median home prices, what, what is it today, Stephen? Even off the highs, four, 416. 416. Okay, pain, real estate. Median home price, $416,000. Keep that chart up there. But <clears throat> I also want you to understand that I think a lot of people are being let off of a cliff. So let, let's just, you know, I, I'm not a fan of syndications. I've been pretty vocal and open. I've had a couple of people on my podcast talking about them because I'm always trying to learn, but I've, I've never invested in a syndication. Uh, I know some people have, and if you have, great. Okay. Hopefully it's, it's working out well. People like syndications because you get, you get ownership. You're, you're an LP, a limited partner in a big uh, multifamily. And a lot of the, the gurus out there use that. Oh, I, I have thousands of apartment units. No, you don't. You have a small fractional share of a syndication that has thousands of units. You you don't own thousands. Well, I guess you could say you, you own thousands of units, but what percentage of those thousands of units do you own? So it's all smoke and mirrors. But uh, here's the thing I want to understand about, or I want you to understand about or syndications. There's several reasons to get into syndications. Okay, and I'm not saying they're a bad investment. If your reasons are you need tax deductions, okay then that would be a good reason because you can get, you know, if they do cost segregations, you can get share a share in the depreciation. So it can help you from taxes. Most syndications pay a pref return, preferred return in interest rate. Maybe it's four, six, 8%. Uh, if any of you have syndications, you know, post whatever interest rate you're earning. But here's the problem with syndications. You see the trend line. Prices are coming down, which means in most syndications, the goal from the beginning was to go three or five or however many years and then refinance the property. And then all the investors get their money back. Did you, you did, could you just pull that trend line up again? So I'm not saying this can't revert or change, but just, just right here, there's your trend. 
How many of you think you're going to be able to refinance at the bank, which is already tightening at much higher interest rates at the bank, probably pretty close to what they borrowed the money at uh, from private investors? How many of you think they're going to be able to refinance out of those syndications? Does anyone? They're not going to be able to refinance. Now, that's not the end of the world. They're apartment complexes. So they're, they're, they're making money with rental. But if somebody needed liquidity or was looking forward to getting their money back for their syndication to do something else to, to use that money, I, I just got to tell you, that's, just, that's not probably going to happen. Okay, so that's the downside to it. But the good side to it is in the future, if prices keep going down, it's going to be a really good opportunity for all the folks on Private Money Club and all you real estate investors to buy low. And that's the name of the game. You get to buy low and there's your trend. Just trying to show you what's happening here. But the median home price right now is very expensive. 416, interest rates. Stephen, can you pull up a, a mortgage calculator? Let's just see where interest rates are today. Yeah, and, and remember, before I go off here, this is, you know, many people think we were going to see a pullback and a downturn in all the markets, stock market, real estate in 2020. But then the 16, 20 trillion dollars in printed money soared values of everything back up. So when we say prices could pull back, we're not necessarily just saying to these levels. I mean, we could easily see them pulling back to these kinds of levels back in 2010. So just something to keep in mind. I mean, this is where we saw, you know, everybody said this was one of the biggest rises in history, you know, into 2008, but that's nothing compared to what we've seen here recently. So something to keep in mind. Jim Collins said something that's really important that I, I didn't say just because, you know, it's complicated, but I do want to read it. It says the real reason we have inflation is an increase in money supply, you know, the, the printing of money. Printing is printing to pay interest, which is what the government's doing right now, causes more inflation. So it's inflationary. The Fed's trying to combat inflation. The government's doing everything the opposite way. So it's almost like, you know, you, you've got uh, the, the Fed going hard to control inflation, which there, it is. And then you got the government doing the opposite, like he's saying. So until we reduce money supply, infl inflation will always occur. Well said, Jim. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but but I, I'm just trying to just show you. Here's a mortgage calculator, folks. And, and what's unique about bankrate.com is it will put in there what the current rates are. So this is based on somebody with, I think, a really good credit score. But 7.36%. So let me just ask you a question. So can you just do the median home price, Stephen, at 416 7.36, 20% down. So most of you have children on here, right? How many of you have kids? Th these problems that I'm referring for some of you, it's not going to affect you as much as it is your kids. So if you care about your kids, that's why you're listening to what I'm telling you, even though I haven't got to the solutions. But believe me, stick around to the end or even close to the end. We're going to give you all the solutions. But think about your kids, right? They just got done with college. You know, they're entering the workforce starting to build families. Think about millennials, really, you know, maybe not Gen Z, but think millennials. Millennials right now are, you know, approaching the peak of their career, getting to that point where they're, they're hustling, they're doing well, they're making money. So how many millennials do you think can come up with $83,200 as a down payment? Eh, maybe some, right? I mean, how many of your kids could come up with $83,200? I mean, it's a lot of money. My first house that I bought, okay, I bought it for $110,000 and I needed to come up with 5% out of pocket. It was a FHA. So what's 5%, Stephen? Because some of these folks would be FHA, 20 grand. I think I had to come up with like 10 grand with total closing costs, maybe a little bit less. Just to get in the door on the 5%, if you can get FHA, you're 20 grand. So a couple could do that, but go back to the 20%. You know, and just look at the, the monthly payment, 2635. My first mortgage was like 600, 700 bucks. Now, the same, you know, starter house would be 2,635 right there. You know, and we got the insurance and stuff in there, but you could, yeah, homeowner's insurance, there you go. But I mean, like that, this is just, this is the problem I'm trying to say. So the interest rate drives a high monthly payment. So 2,969, roughly. 400 a month is actually cheap in Florida right now, so. Yeah, I mean, and that's wow, cheap. You, but... Certain, some of you on here are in, are in certain parts of the country where you're like, you can't get a house for $416,000. You'd be, you'd literally be living in a tiny house at 416,000 or a shack, or you can't, some people would even say you can't even buy a mobile home for that. I, and that's how crazy it's gotten, but I'm just hitting, I'm hitting the problems because the problems are going to lead to the solution. We must understand the problem to hit the solution. So now Stephen, it, that we've hit real estate, we kind of hit some of the problems with real estate. What this, what I'm trying to show you is we are literally at a breaking point. Pricing is coming down. Why? 
Why is pricing going to continue to go down contrary to what so many other people are telling you or saying out there? They're saying real estate's not going to come down in price. Well, it already is. You saw that. It has to because the demand is not coming from seniors that have saved their entire life. It's not coming from, you know, people so much like myself who are already established and, you know, and so many of you on here, it's coming from mostly millennials and, and younger folks that are just starting in their career and, and maybe don't have a long track history of saving and doing all this. So that's the demand. The demand can't afford the housing stock. And not only that, there isn't much housing stock. And why is there not much housing stock? Well, it's simple to understand. Let's say you own a house. Let's say you bought a house at $200,000 many years ago. And now you can sell it for $600,000. That's attractive, isn't it? You bought it for two hundred, dollars you can buy it for six hundred. dollars But when you bought the house, you had a mortgage at 3%. Now, if you go to get a mortgage, you're going to be at 7.36%. And you're also going to pay a high price for the new house. So if you sell for six hundred, dollars that's awesome. You made yourself you know, a boatload of money, made four hundred dollars that's a good day in the office, but now you got to buy another house to move in unless you're downsizing. That's the transitions we're seeing. So the demand is simply because people just aren't selling their house, even though they can get top price. Very few people, unless they're downsizing, being forced to move because of a job or other you know, sub substantial reasons, people are just staying put. They're staying put, creating demand. So where's, where's the, the housing stock coming from? Builders. Builders are building a lot of houses, but they're expensive. So all I'm trying to paint the picture, folks, with all this data is the housing prices have to come down. They have to. And they will. And they already are. So when they start coming down, all of you, all you should be hearing is reading between the lines. You need to be ready. You need to be ready for that. Big opportunity. More millionaires are made in real estate than anything else. How? Buying low or doing different strategies and doing things. But the easiest way is just buying the right cycle. So it's coming, folks. It's, it, we're, we're so freaking close, so close. Do you ever feel like you don't have control of your real estate business or your money? That's right. The big banks and the institutions, they're in control, right? I know you've felt that before. Private Money Club puts you back in the driver's seat. As members often tell us, it's a total game changer. Join the community of like-minded lenders and borrowers by going to privatemoneyclub.com sign up. But let, let, let me go to one other thing. And I think this is the thing you, you've heard me say this a lot. How many of you are brand new to this today? How many of you are brand new on here? Just put I in the chat. Because maybe some of you haven't heard me talking about this a lot, but I'm, I'm going to hit it again. Give you a repeat for some of you. Some of you are going to be like, I don't, I, you know, I'm sick of hearing this from Chris. But if you're sick of hearing it, I hope you already did something about it. Stephen, pull up the stock market. I don't care. S&P 500, Dow Jones, NASDAQ. Anyone see where the stock market is today? Okay, because the Fed got down, or I'm sorry, the uh, United States government got downgraded. The, the markets are down today, 251 points down. Okay, I don't know if that's going to continue uh, for the recording. I got to move our faces out of the way. Okay, just so you can see it. So you can see, where are we at? Go to the longest. That's a one month. Let's, let's do a 10-year chart. What do you see when you look at that? What is the, the glaring, obvious thing that you see right now looking at that chart? Please tell me the right answer. What is the one thing that you should recognize? Okay, up, about to drop. Hi, all right, Rick. Rick nailed it. Can, can anyone contest that, that, that we are at a high point in the market? Look at that. We, we are at a 52-week high, but we're almost at all-time highs. The highest point ever right there. If you can look back just after, it was about 2022 before it went down a little bit, and that was just last year, okay? That was the highest point. Look how close we are. First off, Kudos to the markets. I can't believe this happened. I literally, I've been wrong the whole time. I can't believe we are literally testing the all-time highs of the market. In a time when it's blatantly obvious, the economy is weakening, the Fed is curbing inflation by raising interest rates, everything's more expensive, like things are weakening, logistic companies, yellow trucking is, is, are going bankrupt. Like you can see the sign. But here we are at the all-time highs. That right there should be the only freaking thing any of you that have money in the stock market should see because it's very simple to understand what is going to happen next. And I don't need to draw it. I don't need to paint a picture. Just look at the chart and then think in your head the things that we just talked about. Is the economy growing? Are we doing really well? 
is everybody like going to be making more money? Are companies going to be popping up and making tons more? Yes, I know the only stuff you see in the news are companies that are reporting positive earnings. And you know what those companies are? They're like seven of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. Steven, do you have that chart? I just want yeah. to make sure why the market's all all-time highs. I want everybody to see this because it's not that the overall S&P 500, the 500 stocks are doing great. It's like seven of them that are. And they're the same seven ones we've been talking about for a while. So literally like the, the house of cards are being held up by some really strong companies and the rest of them are not doing as well. Steven will pull the chart up in a second. But the only reason I want you to see this is I don't want to just be the one sitting there telling you to do this. I don't want to be the, the talking head that's trying to paint doom and gloom. I'm just trying to be real with you. If you don't sell now, and, and can, can, all right, hold on. Let me, let me ask the audience something. We got 138 people here. Can anyone tell me a reason they would not sell their stocks? Please, in the chat, tell me why you would not want to sell stocks right now or mutual funds or ETFs. And while they're doing that, Chris, remember, the, the only way we got from the crash to where we were was by printing at the time unprecedented amounts of money, which came to be a trillion less than a trillion dollars for the bailout, like you're saying, and then zero interest rates, the zero interest rate policy, as they call it, ZERP. And that's what allowed us to do this. Obviously, that drove inflation. And then we printed ungodly amounts of money to create this, creating more inflation we've seen since the 70s. And to curb that, we've had to mess up the entire systems. And somehow things are still up here. You tell me how that's even possible. I want, I want to see the chat box. It's smoke and mirrors, but I'm just kind of looking in here. And, and I love that you did that because you noticed in the beginning, I talked about the money printing. I talked about all those things. Folks, like I'm not just blabbing my lips. I'm piecing together literally a movie, a story, a, a, a timeline here. Like the reason the markets are there, just seven companies are carrying the S&P 500 in 2023. Seven. Yeah, so Ap Apple, Alphabet, which is Google, Meta Platforms, which is Facebook and Instagram, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Amazon and Tesla. Um, after seeing a bleak 2022, the collective gains have kept the S&P in a positive territory in 2023 with the overall index rising about 7% since the start of the year, but without these seven stocks, which make up nearly 26% of the S&P, the S&P would actually be down 0.8% on the year. Uh, that was through May. And it's about those same numbers as of through July. Awesome. Remember a second ago, I asked, why would you not sell stocks at an all-time high? You know, because here Deborah said sell high, but why would you not? So I'm going to come up and I'm just going to read some of the reasons here. What industry should we uh, be in to survive a recession? Oh, that's Stacey. We'll get to that. That's a very important piece to, at the end of this. Uh, let's see. I see a Grand Canyon near the 2020 mark. Oh, here we go. So Rick said uninformed. Great answer. An honest answer. Uh, uninformed. You know, people just, I mean, people don't even look at their statements. They get it, they open it, they look for a red or a green, they put it away, they throw it out, or they don't even log in. They don't even know. They're just uninformed. Well, okay. Jeff, how many how many financial advisors are recommending people sell right now? Yeah, that'd be a great question. Think about that in a second. I want to hit Jeff's because his is the most logical and one of the biggest things I hear, taxes. Oh, I don't want to sell my stocks because I don't want to pay taxes. Jeff, I'm going to show you the best strategy ever to never have to pay uh taxes on your stocks. So just stick with me in a second and I'll show you that. Uh, Sam, great answer. My horoscope said not to sell. Okay. Uh, Lauren said, listening to your financial advisor, which is why Steven said that, sell high, stock in a 401k company. So some people said 401ks, but what do 401ks have for you to invest in? Mutual funds. What do mutual funds invest in? Stocks. It's the same thing. So just because you have a 401k doesn't mean you're not in the market. You are. You're actually in, in mutual funds, which carry higher fees. Uh, let's see. Can you put the link to the article in the chat? We can put all these articles in there. Yep. Uh, let's see. Bottom line. We're going to see another Ben Bernanke replace <laughs> my horoscope. Hold on. Chris is such a Leo. Uh, let's see. Ill-advised. Just ride the roller coaster. Okay. So now le let me just, I don't need money. And Marie said, okay, but okay. So let me, let me hit on taxes because I'm not going to hit on horoscope. That's, that's your prerogative. I'm going to hit on taxes. And I'm going to hit, I don't need money. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you why both of those are are absolutely terrible reasons to not sell, uh, absolutely terrible reasons. But the other reason thing I want to have is how many of you work with a financial advisor and have had your advisor start recommending that you sell some of your positions? Has anyone? And and if you have, can you just put uh, advisor in the chat? Has your advisor been on the phone with you, 
talking about the situations, asking you about your risk and re return profile again, seeing if your risks have changed and advised you to say to start maybe selling and taking some of the gains off the table. Has anyone? None? There's got to be somebody on here. We've got 137 people. Please, God, tell me somebody on here has an advisor that's telling that. Lauren, advisor has suggested going 60, 40 bonds. 60% stocks? Oh, my God, the efficient frontier. Lauren, you got to tell your advisor that he needs to like, just go back to 2008 when the efficient frontier, the 60, 40 portfolio was blown up and it was deemed to not be the efficient portfolio anymore. Uh, he obviously missed that memo. Uh, let's see, advisor, 40% stock. Okay, that's not terrible. Okay, fire your financial advisor. All right, so let me just go to my board here. I wanna, I wanna hit those two questions. In a financial advisor's defense, I guess, they often don't have other options for you because there's no way for their firm to make money if you're out of some type of markets. And even if they start positioning you in any kind of like real estate REITs, the fees and, and, and whatnot, and those are so insane that it just bleeds away all profits. I mean, those are even worse than syndications, in my opinion, Chris. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. I 100% I agree. Um, but just look at the chart. I mean, I'm just going to keep this super low level. All right. Buy low. We all know to make money in the market, you buy low and you sell high. So we already established this is a high point in the market. And, and I just want to be clear, folks, I don't manage money. Okay. You can't pay me to manage your money. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving you stock tips right now. I'm not making recommendations or suggestions. I'm literally just showing you so you can make your own decision as to what's going on. But we all know the way to make money in the market is buy low, sell high, and don't lose money, right? And not, not a single person on here, not a single person can disagree with that. But there's always, there's always the outliers that say, okay, well, why would I not want to sell this? Taxes, logical, great, taxes. So maybe you bought your stock at $40 a share. It's currently at $200 a share. If you sell it, that's $160 per share profit. Ouch. Capital gains and taxes are going to be heavy on that, right? So why would I sell the stock when I got to pay tax on all that money? I'm going to lose, gosh, I could lose 40% of that money to taxes. Whoever said that, like, that's kind of what you're thinking, right? You could lose a bunch in taxes. But let me just ask you a quick question. Do you think taxes are going up or down? They're going up, okay? So getting out today, paying taxes today is still going to be lower than paying taxes in the future when tax rates go up, but we're not there. So Let's just, let's just, let me show you how to never pay tax on this. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to buy low like you did. When it hits high, you're not going to sell it, okay? We're going to wait. We're going to watch the market and we're going to give it a couple of years. We're going to wait for the markets to go down, 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 down. And all we're looking for, you got you to gotta watch. This is going to take a little bit of management for you because if you don't want to pay tax, this is, this is a little bit of work. So pay attention, okay? We're going to wait for the markets to go down. And, and it's not going to look like that. It's going to be more like this, right? And all we're going to do is we're going to watch that stock. We know we paid $40. When that stock hits 35 to 39 bucks, you're going to sell. That is when you're going. You could even put a, you know, a, a sell order in today because you don't want to pay tax. That's the goal. You don't want to pay tax. So you're just going to put the sell order in at 35 to 39. So now what you've done is you've gotten, you've got, you sold the stock. You now have a loss against your taxes. So whatever you sell at, you know, maybe five dollars a share. So now you get to write off five dollars per share as a loss. I mean, it's a great strategy, right? How many of you like that? Come on, that was I gave that to you for free. You guys should pay for shit like that. You guys like that? It's a great strategy. Never pay tax again on your stock gains ever. Should write a book on that. I know you guys like that, but nobody's liking that. So. Okay, now, now let's, let's reverse. Instead of doing that, let's say you did sell at the high point. You, you sold at $100, $160 profit. You paid 40% in taxes, which you probably not. It's probably capital gains, which peak out at about 20%. So isn't that a better strategy? And then you take the money that you... So here's the thing. How about this? What if you don't have to pay, what if you don't have to pay the taxes on those stock gains? Would you like that better? Now, I'm not, I'm not joking here, but like, what if somebody else paid the taxes for you? So let's just use a round number. Let's just say it was 200 grand, okay? You sold them and you got 200,000 bucks. You got to pay taxes. Stephen, what's 20% uh, of 200 is what, 40,000 bucks? 
So yeah. our $40,000 in taxes, that's your capital gains tax. I'm just making this up, right? Nobody wants to pay 40,000 in capital gains. So what we do is we take the $200,000 from the sale of that stock, that highly appreciated stock, because you sold it at the high point right now. You take the 200K and you basically find private money club, someone like Robin Nicole Fuller. I don't care who it is, not making a recommendation, but you then you lend it out and you make 200 or 12%. So hold on, let's just do the math because we don't want to pay tax. We want someone else to pay the tax. So remember, there's really no more upside. So I think you can erase the fact that you think it's going to go much higher than 200. We got to factor that in. 200,000 times 12%, $24,000 a year is what you're going to make at 12%. So in less than two years, all your taxes were paid by somebody else. The only missing link there would be if you think your stock's going higher. Can you pull that stock chart up again? Because I want, I want to ask a question, folks. It's got to be some betting people on here. Got to be some optimistic people who truly, and, and be honest, who thinks we're going higher? Who thinks we're going to break through the all-time highs? Does anyone? Three more smaller hikes. So, Todd, you think it's going to go up three more times? Could, but I, I guess really what I'm asking is, do you think it's going to go higher than the all-time highs? That's kind of what I'm asking, just being realistic. I mean, maybe we, maybe we do. I mean, it's crazy that we're at where we are. But all I'm trying to point out is like, you may not get another, another chance, folks. You might not get another chance to get out and make the money that you are right now. Now, I'm referring to your 401k. I'm referring to your brokerage accounts, your stock accounts. It, how, but people are sometimes, crazier shit has happened. You're right, Jeff. You're damn right. Crazier shit has happened, but it can't really go much higher. Even if we did break the all-time highs, it's not going to go much higher. So you could still make the case that now still marks the spot. And you know, I'm not trying to time the market at all because you can't, but I'm just looking at the charts and just saying, this is really, really a unique situation that we're in right now. A unique situation because if you get out now, there's a really strong probability you're going to make money. And if it's in a retirement account and you sell your stock, Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Prudential, uh, Vanguard, whoever your stocks or mutual funds or ETFs are with, chances are you might not even have to pay tax because you're not taking money out yet. So if it's in a 401k or retirement account, you don't even need to pay the tax. So you know it doesn't. it's all kind of gravy after that. But I'm just simply trying to show you, like, this is it. Now, what is your advisor telling you? Because nobody on here said their advisor is telling them to take their gains off the table. What is your advisor telling you? Anyone want to like tell me, like, Lauren, what is your advisor telling you? The real mystery is living in the unknown. I want, I want to know. Well, I, I know, like a lot of, well, like a lot of younger people, I hear a lot of the time will say, "Well, over my lifetime, I'm just going to keep, you know, dollar cost averaging in." So over my lifetime, even if we see the downs, it's eventually going to come back up and 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 go up. And so that's something I hear sometimes as well, Chris. Which is right. I mean, it's it's completely right. I mean, if a market, you know, goes up like this is this, and let's just say it comes down. OK, eventually it's going to come back up and it's going to make higher highs. So actually, let me change this just so you kind of get an idea. Like, here's where we're at all time highs now, probably going here. And eventually it's going to make time. But if we look at the cycles from peak to peak, let's just do that. It's usually seven to ten, whoops, seven to ten years. OK, so if you ride the roller coaster down because you're going to you're going to buy and hold, your advisor will tell you to do this. Your advisor will say you're in this for the long haul. You got to buy and hold. Look at Warren Buffett. He buys and holds. You don't know the whole story with Warren, clearly, and your advisor doesn't either. You know, they're going to tell you to buy and hold. Can, can anyone tell me why your advisor tells you that? Does anyone know why? Because me and Steven do, because we, we did this. I was an advisor 16 years. Why does your advisor tell you to buy and hold? They still make money, correct. All advisors make money under management, okay? That's what they're taught. Great answer, James. What else? Better for them? Yeah, because they make money. Commission, oh, that's the same thing. They get fees depending on what kind of investments they got you in. If they're selling you mutual funds, A, Bs, or Cs, they're getting a commission. Less, that's what I was looking for, Leroy. Less work. It takes time to call your clients and then talk to them and figure out what the risks are now and say, hey, maybe it's time to get out and then reallocate. That takes time and energy and, and ain't nobody got time for that. Way easier just to say, hey, everything's fine. We'll just ride it out. Yeah, it could get a little bumpy. You're going to ride it out. Now, let me just paint this picture and then we're going to get into some of the solutions, right? If you lose 20%, Something like 30. I'm looking for the drawdown effect. If you lose 30, I start getting better as we go. 46%. If you lose 40, 
And if you lose 50, it's 100%. Does everybody understand what I just drew here? It's called the drawdown effect. I, I, this one's off a little bit. I, Steven's going to get it for me. This is what your advisor is telling you to do. They're telling you to wait it out, ride it out. It's going to get a little bumpy. Now, I don't know how much we're going to lose, but if we lose 30, you got to make 46% back just to get the 30 back that you lost. That's if you stay invested in the market and don't get too scared. If you lose 40, okay, you got to make 63% back. And if you lose 50%, which is very probable, you got to make 100% back. How do you like those apples? Did you figure it out, Stephen? 20? Yeah, let's see. Down 25%, you need a 33% return. Um, we'll just go with that. I think the rest yeah. of them are pretty close. 10%, okay. you need 11% to break that's even. The one, that's the one I was missing. If you're down 10%, you need 11. There was one that wasn't much. So realistically, like this is your cutoff. You'd never want to ride the market out any lower than I'd say 20% because it gets too difficult to make back what okay. you've lost. So when they say buy and hold, when they say just you're in this for the long haul, this is what the long haul looks like. Now, let me just ask you a question real quick. Okay, we'll get rid of the 10 and the 11%. If you guys uh, were out hiking, and there's a big ravine, okay? And you're kind of with a couple friends and, you know, just right over here, right down the path, you know, there's a bridge that goes over the ravine. Or the option is you go all the way down the ravine, you, you climb down, you hope you don't fall because it's a rocky ravine. So you climb all the way down the ravine and then you cross the raging river at the bottom, which has alligators in it. Okay, then you got to climb all the way back the upside, other side. How many of you are climbing down the ravine versus... How many of you are going over the ladder? How many ladders do we have? How many, how many, or not ladder, I'm sorry, the bridge. How many of you are taking the bridge? Bridge, anyone, anyone want to go in the ravine? Anyone want to take the hard way through the ravine? Jennifer, you want to take the ravine? Okay, every, everybody wants the bridge. All right, so then please, please explain to me, and, and I'm being so serious with you. Why the F would you take this path? You just said you wouldn't take the ravine, you'd take the damn bridge because the bridge is way faster, way less stressful, and it's a nice freaking view from up there. So again, why would you hold stocks right now? Why? Because what is the bridge? Well, the bridge could be a lot of things. The bridge could, for some of you, be cash, okay? The bridge, for some of you, if you're smart, could be treasury bonds or corporate, you know, AAA rated corporates. It could be uh, BYOB, it could be be your own bank and specially designed whole life. It could be lending. I mean, God, I could go on for days. The bridge is the easy path with the lower risk, which is not anything to do with the, the ravine. The worst thing that could happen in the bridge is, I mean, something goes wrong and the bridge breaks. You just die then. I mean, shit. I mean, that doesn't happen often. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in normal times, I've always agreed with that. You know, just, just ride it out, dollar cost average, stay in for the long haul. But these are not normal times. These, I feel like, are very unprecedented times. And when you look at the chart, like, do you, you know, if, if we felt like we were only going to see maybe a 10% pullback or so, um, sure, but a 10% pullback is to like there. That's like nothing, you know? What we're looking for is can we see a 30% pullback? What's a 30% pullback? That's only 10,000, 11,000 point drop. That's down to this level right around here. And could we see that? A hundred percent. Could we see a 40% drop? 100%. And so when you start looking at it, you need to make so much back in return. That's unprecedented time. So the old verbiage of let's just ride it out over the long haul. Like, I don't see how that applies today. And I just feel like just like everything else, when it comes to traditional financial education, we got to push that stuff to the side right now. Cause it just, it's not working in the, in the world that we live in today, Chris. It's not working at all, folks. And, and Ray Dalio, so Stephen just gave you the pretty picture of where it's going to go. Ray Dalio thinks we're going to probably see 2011, 2012 numbers. So that's that's essentially in what some of Ray Dalio's, you got to read between the lines, but that's essentially where he's saying he thinks it could go. And if you really look at it, it is probably the safest, like, you know, that that's the best floor to really gauge would be around that period of time because it's got the most support across the board. Because you can see, 1990s, 2000s, and 2006. So you could literally draw a straight line over. So you can see what he's doing. He's just going support and resistance lines. You don't really have a lot of floors or support up in those higher levels up there in the mountains that we're in right now. You just don't because it's all unprecedented. It's all money. It's all 
fake pumped in, yeah, yes. yeah fake pump pumped in money with pump zero interest rates. Wow. You're right, Brian. 60% drop to get to those numbers. But I mean, listen, like I, I'm just, I'm not telling you that's where we're going. God forbid we go there. I mean, hopefully my right. 2025 number doesn't even come close to that, but I'm simply trying to get you to understand that like, if you, if you just look at a chart, you don't even need to be smart. Forget about, you don't need to know anything about that chart. Just draw lines. Like go, my daughter, three-year-old could draw a straight line across that. And she could be like, daddy, look straight. Yes. Sweetie, you just connected the dots, connect the dots. And, and that's what that's, that's how it works. It's like anything else. When, when someone falls off of a cliff, they, we always hope if, if you fell off of a cliff, you hope that there's like a ledge that you're going to hit first. Yes, it's going to hurt, but you're going to stop and you're not going to go all the way down. Right. But the bigger the ledge, the more of a probable chance of you hitting the ledge is. If it's a straight sheer cliff, man, you got nowhere to stop that. Where are you going? All the way down. Listen, like I'm just trying to make complicated stock and all this stuff that you hear about and Kramer, who's always wrong. I'm trying to make it simple. Do you want to go down through the canyon, across the river with alligators, back up the other side, or would you like to take the bridge? No toll. Take the freaking bridge. And the bridge is so simple. So here, like, let me just give you some tactical things. I can't give you recommendations, but let me make this very freaking simple. Any of you that have 401ks or 403bs, I got to spell it out, or 457s or TSPs or whatever the hell they're calling your retirement plan, they're all the same, okay? If you've got these, 95% chance the only thing you have are mutual funds. And most of you, if you have a 401k, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. You probably got one of those target date freedom funds, right? Oh, yeah, they said just put my money in this because I'm going to retire around 2045 and it's going to self-adjust and it's all going to be okay. Wrong. Highest fee funds there are. They're, I hate target date funds. They're for the lazy. They're for the ones that don't want to know anything. They just want to lose money. Stay out of those things. If you got money in a 401k, here's what you're going to be looking for. Cash. Okay. Money market. Just giving you keywords. You guys can write this down. Okay. Money market. Okay. You can look for treasury bond. Okay. You could look for uh, government bond or for the, you know, for your government employees, it's called the G fund. These are the things you could be looking for. And how much should go in these? Well, it depends on, you know, your risk tolerance. I don't know. Some, you know, like, uh, I can't remember who it was that said, somebody said uh, 60%. So I would start there and I would go north from there. I would start with 60% goes in these. Now you're not going to hardly make any money in cash. You're probably not going to make hardly any money in money market. But can I ask all of you a question? Would you rather make nothing or lose 30%? Don't answer that. I know the answer. So that's what you look for in 401ks. Now, some of you have money in brokerage accounts. Okay, like, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade. Here's what you can look at. These, this is not a recommendation, just for the record. You know, attorneys, this is not a recommendation or a suggestion. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm simply telling everybody on here what I am buying in my portfolio. Okay, Kramer does this. I am buying TLT. I am buying Zeros. okay? And there's many more. I have a whole list of them in my phone. So what is TLT? 20 plus year Treasury bonds, okay? What is Zeros? 30 plus year, zero coupon, so no interest, zero coupon, treasury bonds, okay? And what the hell? Let's go for the gusto. For some of you, you might be like, oh, I don't know. I, I want to just do short-term stuff. I might not want to wait. I might need the money soon. Great. Let me give you a really, really short-term. If, if some of you have like a super duper short time horizon, like zero to one year, you could try this one, which I also am buying, CLTL, zero to one year. You're going to make less money in that, okay? Or SCHO, for, these are short-term bonds. These would be like T-bills, but they pay a good interest rate right now. So like any of these in a brokerage would be good ones to look at and do your own due diligence on. These are what I'm buying, okay? Now, now let's get to the fun stuff. For those of you that have money, but you don't know what to do with it. We do this, we talk about this all the time, love it or hate it, okay? But this is what the wealthy do, specially designed whole life insurance, okay? 
please have us do it because we know how to design these things the right way. It's not just because we get a commission. I mean, that's always helpful because that allows us to do these videos for free. I mean, we don't, we could stop selling, you know, the whole life policies. We could stop doing them and you could go to our competitors and then you can just pay to come on wealth webinar. We'll charge, I don't know. What do you think, Stephen? 200, 300 bucks every week. I think that'd probably be good. Right. You want the free webinars? Great. So this is how we make money. Okay. We, we make very little per policy, but we do thousands of them, especially design whole life. Why would you do this? Well, if you like the word guaranteed, that's a good start. Guaranteed interest right now, the policies that we write go from three to 3.75% guaranteed. Some of you are like, yeah, but I'm getting more in my savings account today. Maybe not next year. When they drop interest rates, you're going to get less. Okay. Guaranteed for the rest of your life. But Hey, if you don't like that number, that's okay because every insurance company that we deal with pays a dividend and has every year since they've been in existence. And those dividends, when we combine the guaranteed interest rate and the dividend, the lowest we're getting on any of the companies is 5.2. The highest is 6%. How do you like them apples? You're not getting that in your savings account or bank account. Nope. So that's still pretty good. But here, it's even better. Tax-free. So depending on your tax rate, if we did the tax equivalent yield for your stocks in a non, because this is non-qualified money, non-retirement money. So I'm just going to write NQ, non-retirement money. So if you got stocks in a brokerage or with your advisor to get 5.2 to 6%, depending on your tax rate, I, I don't know, you could do the calculation, but it's probably like 7.4% you got to make. How many of you think 7.4 is a sustainable number? If I go back and I do a 30-year average of the S&P 500, I don't even think I can get that. But that's what you'd have to earn to get the equivalent of a tax-free return that you can get inside of a guaranteed instrument called a whole life policy. Okay, making sense to you? But see here, it gets even better. So who cares about the interest rates? Oh, I do. I, I like that. Yeah, well, what if we can take the money out of the whole life and then we can do whatever we want? We can buy uh, stocks when they're 40% off. Okay, so let's we say we buy stocks 40% off. We take a loan from the policy that was paying us, let's just use the lowest, the 5.2. Policy's paying us 5.2. They're going to charge us five. So we made 0.2% spread. Okay, I'm just putting that as the lowest. But then we get to go over here in the stocks and we make whatever the stocks are. Let's say the dividend's 3%. So now we made money twice on the same dollars. But you see, every year the spread goes up because every year you're compounding. And every year, if that was $100,000 that we took out of the whole life to buy stocks, your money never left your account. It's still 100000 in your account, earning interest and dividends, even though you took 100,000 out and put it into stocks. Oh, you don't want stocks? Great. What if you just lend it? Like we teach at Private Money Club, like we're gonna be teaching this weekend in North Carolina for two days for the Money Tank event. How many of you bought tickets so far for Money Tank, virtual or in person? Put MT in the chat. There you go, Drew's coming. Awesome. So all these folks are gonna go out there and they're gonna learn how they can be the bank Okay, I'll just write BYOB, be your own bank by lending. And if they're doing that, I'll tell you right now, you're not making any less than 12% in first position. No less than that. Far better than stocks, okay? 12% secured with a tangible asset. So see folks, what I'm trying to do is link together everything I did in the beginning now, bringing it full circle and giving you tactical things to do with your money that all makes sense. And some of you are like, yeah, well, can I do this lending without the policy? Sure you can. Hell, I don't know. Some of you just for some reason like putting your money in the bank. So let's just say you got a savings account. You're only going to make money once, but you got a savings account. There's no spread. You could lend the money over here and make 12. So if the savings account's paying you 4%, let me ask you a question. If your savings account's paying you, here, let's go high. Somebody yesterday had 5%. Your savings account's paying you 5%. You got hundred grand in there but you have the op opportunity for a really low risk lending deal to make 12. Do you want to make five or do you want to make 12? You want to make 12, right? So you take the money from your savings, the hundred K and you, you, you withdraw the money because you don't have the ability to loan. So you withdraw the money and you put it over here. Is the bank paying you any interest on the $0 you have over there? No. See the difference? It's a big difference. The whole life allows you to earn uninterrupted compound interest. The savings account, the money market account does not. Because when you take the money out of the savings or money market, the money's gone. It's into this deal. When you take the money out of the whole life, you're not using your money. The insurance company is lending you money from their general account. They're literally advancing you part of your death benefit. And that's the money that's being used to lend out. So you see, it's always 
always going to make more sense to use the policies to lend, the policies to buy cars, the policies to pay down debt. Why? Uninterrupted compound interest. Actually, let me make it third grade level. Math. Can't put it any simpler than that. <laughs> Mathematics. That's why. Yeah, there we go. We, we put the link up there for any of you that have not yet gotten your tickets. At this point, it's a couple of days away. Unless you live in the Carolinas, probably not hop in a plane. Maybe someone on here is going to, but you're probably more opt, you know, probably more looking at the virtual tickets. So if you want to join us this weekend, Friday, Saturday, even if you can't join us, you just want the content, you just want to learn, we're going to record it all. Okay. It's going to be edited, professionally edited and time stamped. So you'll get all the recordings after we do the two days. We have speakers for the virtual that we don't even have for the live. So we have virtual and live, both are being brought together. So the virtual actually gets all the speakers, including the virtual speakers. That normally is $297 for the virtual tickets. But today, if you buy now, it's 97 bucks. And check this shirt out. This is one of our brand new t-shirts. I'll give you this shirt for free, okay? It says, your happiness as a person is dependent on what you measure yourself against. And then it's got the BYOB logo down on the bottom. So you can get this shirt or any shirt on there, but I'll give you the shirt to anybody today that buys a virtual ticket, $97. Okay, there's the, the link up there. It's the code you need is called PMC virtual and I need your shirt size, okay? So in the notes, put your shirt size and maybe your address if we don't already have it. So that's the offer, okay? Join us for two days in Money Tank. Money Tank, we're gonna go deep into the BYOB. We're gonna go really deep into that. But you know, the other thing too at Money Tank that's gonna happen is there's gonna be a whole bunch of people in the room that think like you. Can be a whole bunch of people, about a hundred attendees, okay, that either have money or need money. It's like a breeding ground for money. Gosh, you know, I, I think we're going to have to uh, provide protection at the door, Stephen. So we might have to stop off at the store and get some protection because we gotta we gotta have safe lending, man. So let's get the let's get the protection at the door because there's going to be a lot of a lot of hanky panky going on at Money Tank, and hanky panky is going to make a lot of money. So. Just want to make sure that you're all protected. And we're going to teach you how to protect yourself when you come. And also, if you're coming virtually, it's no different. We're going, to, we're going to give you the protection you need to make sure that your money stays safe and secure and it doesn't have to be shared. Okay? So that's uh, some of the things we're going to do. What else do we got, Stephen? I see a couple of questions over there in the, um, the chat box we can hit. Let's hit them. In the Q&A. So uh, let's see. So Stacy was just saying, what? So what's a good business... Uh, to get into going into a recession, your opinion? Wow, a lot of businesses. I mean, I was just reading an article the other day, during a recession is one of the absolute best times to start a business because your competition's a lot lower. A lot of people are scared, so they're not taking chances. They're not going out there starting businesses. And first and foremost reason is there's an awful lot of people that need their problems solved. So just look at the pandemic, how many new businesses were created out of the pandemic? lots because there's a lot of problems that were created because of the pandemic that needed to be solved. So every recession is going to create massive opportunity. But if you want to look at existing industry, that's usually pretty recession proof. There's a whole bunch of different businesses that are pretty recession proof. Uh, Stephen, what would you say are some of the most recession proof businesses you can get into? Um, I always used to say Philip Morris, like, you know, cigarettes and alcohol. Uh, and I say that because during recessions, people are feeling pretty lousy. So they drink more, they smoke more, but I don't know if that still holds true. And that might not ethically be something you want to invest in. Yeah, um, I mean, usually you see a big disruption and um, you see a big disruption in, in just all industries. And a lot of times that opens the door, like you're saying, to bring other competition in. I mean, I believe in 2000, like with the dot-com crash and people were hurting where things like when Uber was, was created and, and Airbnb was created when the hotel industry was struggling. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in real estate um, to be a, a real, an active real estate investor and, and get into that. So the most important part, regardless of the type of industry that you get into though, is to be prepared for it. So now is the time to kind of decide what do you want to do? What kind of business would you like to own? And you know how can you launch that? How can you do that? And where's the money going to come from? So get your money together, get your finances together, get partners, get 
you know, lending in place, you know, find people that you want to work with and partner with. And now's the time to prepare for it. So when opportunities do arise, you're ready to take action and make things happen. And those are the ones, regardless of the type of business, those are the ones that are going to succeed and do very, very well. Yeah. And I love what Jill said. Jill said ne necessary day to day or sorry, I just went, I just lost it. Necessary day to day services. So service businesses that take care of needed things day in and day out. So like some things that don't get hit in recession is usually medical. Okay. So medical industry is usually pretty resilient because whether or not the recession is bad, people still need medical care. Um, you know, like you know, that's why we always talk assisted living. So nursing homes are usually pretty resilient, uh, necessary day to day. Just think something that someone can't live without. Those are usually pretty good. Toilet paper is usually pretty good. Food, certain types of food. Now, you got to be careful what food you're, you're investing in in that industry, uh, but that's usually pretty resilient. Um, I mean, looking at Warren Buffett, I mean, Coca-Cola is pretty recession proof, although it will certainly come off of the highs. That's usually a pretty good uh, bet during stuff like that. So always think like what Jill said, necessary day-to-day -day services. Um, I do want to come up uh, and thank you uh, for telling uh, Tim that. Yeah, Tim. So we, we don't always just show big numbers. Matter of fact, I usually show smaller numbers. So the one you saw must have been a rare one. Um, typically, it's 10 times your age. So I'm 46 out of zero. 460 a month would be my minimum. So Tim, however old you are, just add a zero after it. That would be your minimum monthly to get started. So you don't need the big numbers. I think we just happened to show them a, a few times when we were getting into real estate stuff. All right. Bought your first virtual ticket. Congrats. Yes, I love that. HVAC. People still, no matter how bad the recession is, they want to be cool in the summer, especially Arizona folks at 108 degrees. They don't want to be hot. So air conditioning, air conditioning service companies, heating companies. Okay. In the, in the Northeast, it's pretty cold up here. Uh, laundromats, people got to wash their undies. I mean, come on. You're not going to not wash your, oh, God forbid you forget to wash your undies, but all those are good businesses in recession. So Stacy, great question. Uh, Denise, is the market, okay, wait, if the market is at an all-time high, why should we invest in safer strategies? So, well, I, I kind of already hit that, Denise. I don't know if you want me to elaborate, but you just don't want to ride the roller coaster when you can just go over the bridge. So that would be, you know, this stuff. I kind of did a couple sheets on that. But really here, th this is why. You don't want to ride the roller coaster down because of the drawdown effect. All of you should write that down and maybe show that to your advisor if your advisor is talking you, you know, out of you know, maybe taking some of this suggestions. The drawdown effect is very real. Most advisors know about it, but very rarely talk about it. I know I never talked about it when I was an advisor. I wanted, I wanted to hush that one really quick because that just meant people moved their money and I wasn't managing it. Yes. So Sam said in 2008, I did, he didn't work for almost a full year. Plumbers, electricians, auto mechanics. Yes, those are all good because you need them, right? If you're, uh, you know, remember the movie uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation? Shitter's full. You're calling the plumber, folks. So the plumber's coming out. But you got to be careful with some of the trades because a lot of the trades returns are based on, on new build and building. So yes, maintenance companies would be the better ones to go after. Companies that specialize in maintenance for apartment buildings. Because if somebody calls and says, hey, shitter's full and overflowing, like somebody's going out. Uh, I don't know about clothing. Uh, clothing definitely would not, not, depending on what kind of clothing, self-storage is another one that a lot of people think is recession-proof, but it's really not as recession-proof as you think. Um, a lot of people don't have the excess of money or the extra money to pay for the self-storage. Now in 2008, which is why Todd's thinking self-storage in 2008, the self-storage industry boomed, but that was because people were losing their homes. So I don't know how that's going to play out. If people start losing their homes, if foreclosures start happening, if you got another, you know, big burst in the real estate bubble, then yes, I would agree to self-storage, but I wouldn't say that that's definitely a, a recession-proof industry asphalt uh, repairs, any government, uh, here'd be a good bet. Um, so Sam's kind of hitting on that, but any government contractor that is working for the government, because during recessions, governments try to spend more money. They print, you know, the, the money gets printed, they borrow more money. Yes, it is possible for the Fed, the government to borrow more money than they are now. They borrow money and they start spending it in the account or in industries like government contracts, because that stimulates the economy back up. So all these are great things.
Uh, let's see. Vicky said, if in a 401k, do you convert it to cash for now? You could, or you could just, you know, I put these up on the board. You could kind of just look for some of these, which would be uh, good options. You know, cash, I don't know. I, mean, I just put it up there. You don't want to sit in cash for too long or money markets. So these would just be, these would be short term, like super short term, just a, a resting place. Think of, you know, you just climbed all the way down the ravine. You're tired. You want to rest, or you just went for a run for the first time in six years. You, you might have to stop and take a rest. This is you just taking a rest to figure out where you're going to go. I think treasury bonds are great. Government, you know, G fund is great. You're going to hemorrhage a little bit while the fed is still raising rates, but believe me in the long run, that'll definitely be a good play. James said, what are some of the best companies to hold your infinite banking concepts? James, you should book a call with us. We can go into it, but I'll give you a few. Lafayette Life is, is a really good one. One America is probably one of the best right now. Guardian, Penn Mutual. I don't really love Penn, uh, but Security Mutual. Those are some good options. Maybe Emeritus. I just haven't really played with them too much, but just to give you a few, but that's what we do, James. We build those policies. We're very, if not, we're probably one of the best. And I don't mean to toot our horn, but it's all we do day in and day out. We've done it thousands and thousands of times. So it's kind of like anybody else, the 10,000 hour rule, we're at shit, we're like 100,000 hours. So we got this dialed, so we know how to do it. And uh, we'd, we'd love to help you out. So James, uh, Stephen will put the uh, contact info to book a call and a video that you can watch because I just kind of hit the surface of it and you can uh, book a call with us. Yeah, mapping team. We also have the mapping team, which works with you to help map out what your needs and goals are that you want to solve. National life. Uh, that's a good one, Deborah. A lot of people ask about national life. I don't hear national life a lot, so, but I don't have a lot of experience with them. Off the cuff, I would say probably not, not even in the top 10. Um, could they work if they have a, a whole life and they're mutually owned and you know, hopefully they're direct, not uh, direct recognition, then possibly. Yes, Sam said, One America is amazing. Best customer service ever. They, they really are. They're one of the best. Uh, laundromat during our session. Yeah, I kind of hit that, Todd. Uh, rewatch the recording of this. So Denise, you can rewatch the recording of this in a few days when it goes up on my YouTube. But this, this one will go on at the Chris Noggles YouTube. So the 107 people here, if I can ask a favor, if you can all go to my YouTube at the Chris Noggle. So here, let me just show this to you here real quick. I just put the link in the chat box. You just okay. click it. What I would really, really appreciate, and this doesn't cost you anything but your time. You can do it with me right now. So just go to YouTube, type in the Chris Noggle. It'll bring you here. And what I would like you to do is come over and I would like you to click the subscribe button. Okay, just subscribe to it. Doesn't cost you anything. And then there's a little alert. You hit that too. So, you know, when you're subscribing, this is all you need to do. Just come up here, subscribe. And then that's it. Okay. And then also, if you find a video you like, so maybe like when that 2025 video comes out, it's not up yet. But when you are in a video watching it, make sure you like the video. Beep. Just like that. That's all. Okay. You can even share it if you really freaking like it. But uh, that helps me tremendously because the more subscribers we get, we're at 24,900. We need to be at like 200,000, but I need your help to get there. So just give that little bell a little click. See, check it out. Thank you. All right. Let's see. What else do we got? Convert for cash. We hit that one. Would a credit union over a bank fit into your format? Yeah, of course. I love credit unions. So Hurl, credit unions are great. They're just limited in scope of what they'll do. But if you're just using them for your banking, best there is. Okay, credit unions are by far the tippity tippity top for traditional banks, followed by community banks. And you know, I don't like commercial banks. Uh, if you have a 401k that is in stocks and some mutual funds, you have to take it out in the next year or two. Which account would you su suggest taking money out of? Lynette, we should book a call. Seriously, like if you're going to need that money in the next year or two, then I would almost say you need to go 100% cash or maybe split it between cash and government bonds. Uh, you need to be very careful because otherwise you're, you're going to be taking a lot less money out. So Lynette, don't monkey with that. And the stocks and the mutual funds, remember mutual funds are just a, a bunch of different stocks in a, a set category. Like large cap means large company, small cap means small company, mid cap means mid-sized companies, and then international means international companies, growth, value. There's all sorts of different names, but 
for you, you probably should just, if you got a really short time horizon before you take your money, you should probably really look at just getting out for right now. Just take the bridge and uh, cash, money markets and all that good stuff. Lynette, yes, uh, at 70 and a half, okay? You're gonna be faced with what's called RMDs, required minimum distributions. The government literally says, okay, we've let you tax defer this money long enough. Now you gotta start taking it and you gotta start paying us tax. So you, that, that's probably what you're referring to in the Q&A. So yeah, if you're, if you're there, just, just go cash or you know, government or the safest darn thing you can put the money in. James said, do you know if Medicaid looks at whole life policies as part of your assets when considering their benefits? Probably not. It's probably deemed as life insurance. Um, but I don't know that to be fact. I know Medicaid has changed a lot of their, their things they look at. They've really put people underneath the microscope. If it was inside of a trust, no, they couldn't touch it if it's after the look back. But James, I, I would check with a, an estate attorney on that. I, I'm not, I wouldn't be the expert to tell you that. I would want to say, no, they really wouldn't look at it because it's deemed life insurance. But if they wanted to, they probably could. So I don't want to give you a yes or a no. Just check with your, your estate attorney or just go online and look for an estate attorney. And somebody's probably asked that question online in some form. Let's see. Nope, they don't. So I let me just ask this as we wrap this up. Was this helpful? If it was helpful, put yes in the chat. And also, if it was not helpful, if you just thought this was a waste of your time, just put waste because we can always make it better. I mean, today we kind of took you on a journey. We didn't get right into one topic. We took you on a journey because it's better for you to learn so you understand why you're making the decisions you are making. Um, you know, and it would be fine if somebody said that this was a waste of time, you know, but they probably already hopped off already anyway. So now let me ask you a second question. If this was helpful, how many of you are going to actually apply? some of this knowledge. In other words, how many of you are actually gonna take action, put action in the chat? Terry's always taking action. Joe's taking action. Jennifer, Joe, Jordy, gosh, she's coming in quick, hot and heavy. All right, awesome. That's what I like to hear. Because it, listen, like if you liked it and it was good knowledge, knowledge means nothing if it's not applied. So I always wanna see how many of you are actually gonna take action now, the, the important thing is it's easy to put it into a chat. Now, the important thing is, is find an accountability partner. Find somebody that's going to hold you to taking action. Like, even if you got to just send me an email saying, I, I took action, look, you know, shoot me an email, contact at Chris Noggle, contact at Chris Noggle, send me your action steps that you took from today's webinar. That would make me feel good. And then, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.